Tonight, torrential downpours. Heavy rains have caused significant disruptions and damage in eastern India. NATO comments. NATO defense ministers address Russia's nuclear arsenal at the alliance's Brussels headquarters. Uzbek relations. The South Korean leader has commenced an official state visit to Uzbekistan to strengthen their diplomatic and economic ties between the two nations. And endangered wild horses. Przewalski's horses have returned to the steppes of Kazakhstan after nearly 200 years. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for tuning in tonight on World News. We have lots of fresh updates to bring to you and we begin tonight in India. Heavy rains caused damage to Kalimpong district in eastern India's West Bengal state yesterday and trees were uprooted as well as roads and property damaged following the deluge. Locals living near the district river said he lost everything they owned. Torrential rains frequently triggered deadly flash floods and landslides in mountainous areas of India. The country and other parts of Asia have also experienced an unusually hot summer, a trend that scientists say has been worsened due to human-driven climate change change. South Korea's President Yoon touched down in Uzbekistan, which is the third and final stop of his Central Asia tour. Ahead of his bilateral summit with Uzbek President Shavkat Mizyoev, today the South Korean leader summarized what he hopes to arise from the partnership. President Yoon song yeol plans to ramp up South Korea's special strategic partnership with Uzbekistan through stronger cooperation in resources and infrastructure, as well as cutting-edge technology. In a written interview with an Uzbek media outlet published Thursday, ahead of his state visit to the Central Asian country, Yoon said he aims to bolster bilateral ties to become more mutually beneficial and future-oriented. Since establishing diplomatic ties in 1992, South Korea and Uzbekistan have broadened the scope of their economic cooperation to include automobiles, energy, electronics, textiles, finance and telecommunications, with bilateral trade hitting an all-time high of 2.46 billion US dollars last year. Yoon said his three-day visit will aim to build on the two countries' special strategic partnership forged in 2019 and establish close cooperation on energy, infrastructure and supply chains and crucially, critical minerals to power Korea's high-tech industries, including semiconductors. The president highlighted advanced digital technology and AI semiconductors as key areas of collaboration. In a summit with Uzbek President Shavkat Mirziyoyev and a bilateral business forum scheduled Friday, Yoon also plans to back Korean companies in their efforts to secure local energy and infrastructure projects and make inroads into other industries. So far, Korea-Uzbekistan relations have made remarkable progress centered on the energy and infrastructure fields. And today, cooperation is expanding to more diverse fields such as supply chains, healthcare, climate change, education and public administration. Acknowledging the 170,000 ethnic Koreans living in Uzbekistan, Yun described it as a brother nation as it's the only country in the region that has a special strategic partnership with Korea. He also pledged greater interest and support for overseas Koreans going forward. And on the road to the White House tonight, the former U.S. President Donald Trump returned to Capitol Hill for the first time since the January 6 riot of 2021. Trump gathered the full House of Republican lawmakers where he delivered freewheeling remarks. Former President Trump back on Capitol Hill for the first time since the January 6th attack by his supporters. We agree just about on everything, and if there isn't, we work it out. A congressional pep rally of sorts for the likely GOP nominee, speaking to lawmakers behind closed doors. There's tremendous unity in the Republican Party. We want to see borders. We want to see uh, strong military. We want to see just success for our country. And... We don't have success right now. Among the signs of Mr. Trump's success rallying his party, the attendance of top Senate Republican Mitch McConnell, who hasn't spoken to the former president in four years. He's sharply criticized Mr. Trump, calling him practically and morally responsible for what happened on January 6th.
U.S. President Joe Biden and Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky signed a 10-year bilateral defense deal billed as a NATO precursor. U.S. President Joe Biden and Ukraine President Vladimir Zelensky signed a 10-year bilateral security agreement on Thursday aimed at bolstering Ukraine's defense against Russian invaders. The deal signed on the sidelines of the G7 summit in Italy aims to commit future U.S. administrations to support Ukraine, even if former President Donald Trump wins November's election, officials said. Our goal is to strengthen Ukraine's credible defense and deterrence capabilities for the long term. A lasting peace for Ukraine must be underwritten by Ukraine's own ability to defend itself now and to deter future aggression any time in the, in the future. The United States is going to help ensure that Ukraine can do both. This is an agreement on steps to guarantee sustainable peace, and therefore it benefits everyone in the world because the Russian war against Ukraine is a real, real global threat. The agreement indicates the U.S. will provide weapons and ammunition and intelligence sharing and is meant to be a step toward Ukraine's eventual NATO membership. Zelensky has long sought this, but allies have stopped short of taking that step. Also Thursday, G7 leaders agreed in principle on plans to issue $50 billion of loans for Ukraine, backed by interest from Russian sovereign assets frozen after Moscow launched its invasion of its neighbor in 2022. This comes one day after the U.S. dramatically broadened sanctions on Russia including by targeting China-based companies selling semiconductors to Moscow as part of its effort to undercut the Russian military machine waging war on Ukraine. Trump has expressed skepticism of Ukraine's continued fight, saying at one point that he would end the conflict on his first day in office. He met with lawmakers in Washington Thursday who said he criticized a $60 billion aid package for Ukraine that recently passed with Republican support. French President Emmanuel Macron stated that French voters will integrate the Olympics into their election decision while giving a statement on the sidelines of the G7 summit. The French president also discussed Ukraine, saying it is now up to finance ministers to work on details regarding a Ukraine mechanism that has been agreed upon at the summit. Leaders of the G7 major democracies had earlier agreed on an outline deal to provide 50 billion US dollars of loans for Ukraine using interest from Russian sovereign assets frozen after Moscow invaded its neighbor in 2022. France is taking part in the summit alongside Britain, Germany, Canada, Japan, Italy, the United States and the European Union. Some days after, Macron called a snap election upon his party's low performance in the European parliamentary polls. A preliminary projection by the Integrated Food Security Phase Classification states that more than three quarters of a million people in war-ravaged Sudan will be suffering catastrophic food shortages in the coming months. More than three quarters of a million people could face catastrophic food shortages in Sudan by September. That's according to a preliminary projection used by United Nations agencies and aid groups to determine whether famine should be officially declared. The preliminary results as of June the 1st represent a rapidly deteriorating situation in the war-torn country. Since April last year, the Sudanese army has been fighting the paramilitary rapid support forces. On Wednesday, WHO Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus said 12 million people have been displaced in what is the world's largest humanitarian crisis. People are dying from a lack of access to essential services and medicines, while there is a very real risk of mass starvation in some regions. The latest projection by the Integrated Food Security Phase Classification, or IPC, states that between June and September, an estimated 756,000 people will be in Phase 5 catastrophe. That means the country has not yet reached famine, but is still considered a major crisis. By comparison, the last IPC projection, released in December, did not classify anyone as being in a catastrophic situation. The latest projection is preliminary and could change. It would also require approval by Sudan's military-run government as well as UN and international agencies. 
Whether a famine could be declared is unclear. In areas formerly designated as Phase 5 Famine, more than two people per 10,000 are dying daily, among other criteria. Governments sometimes challenge famine data and projections, and Sudan's government has previously denied that the country is experiencing famine. However, the US Special Envoy to Sudan said last week that some parts of the country are already there. The question, Tom Periello said, is how much famine, how much of the country, and for how long. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. NATO defense ministers commented on Russia's nuclear arsenal today as they arrive for a second day of meetings in the alliance's headquarters over in Brussels. Dutch Defence Minister Kastja Ollongren said that they have nuclear capabilities as NATO and they never would use it in that type of rhetoric that we're hearing from Russia. Estonian Defence Minister Hanno Pufka warned that Russia will not change and that alliance members need to invest more in defence. Russia stated that its troops had started the second stage of drills to practice the deployment of tactical nuclear weapons alongside Belarusian troops after what Moscow said were threats from Western powers. In sending thousands of troops to Ukraine on February 24th of 2022, Russian President Vladimir Putin has repeatedly said Moscow could use nuclear weapons to defend itself in extreme situations. Boeing confirmed today that it's working on a new quality control problem involving one of its planes. It comes as Federal Aviation Administrator Michael Whitaker testified on Capitol Hill about flight safety. Boeing's latest problem is with the 787 Dreamliner. The company confirms hundreds of fasteners on the plane's fuselage appear to have been over-tightened and installed incorrectly. Boeing says the affected planes have not yet been delivered to airlines, and it's taking the time necessary to ensure all airplanes meet its delivery standards prior to delivery. Dozens of inspectors now on Boeing production lines after the MAX 9 door plug blowout in January revealed serious quality and safety lapses, even though Boeing was supposed to be under FAA audit. I'm very concerned that, you know, your oversight is not strong enough. But Whitaker says FAA inspections are now far more robust and Boeing aircraft production remains capped. Meanwhile, Boeing whistleblowers continue to report concern. Tesla shareholders have approved CEO Elon Musk's $56 billion pay package, affirming their support for his leadership and providing a significant incentive for him to maintain his focus on his primary source of wealth. Elon Musk has won shareholder approval for his $56 billion pay package at Tesla. That's a record sum in US corporate history. The result of the shareholder vote was announced at the automaker's annual general meeting in Austin, Texas. Though Musk had signalled his confidence hours earlier, posting on X that he was winning by a wide margin. The result does not mean he gets his money immediately, however. Musk still has to resolve a lawsuit over the pay package in a Delaware court. It was a judge there who first voided the payout, saying Tesla's board had been beholden to the billionaire. Quinn says Tesla will have to show that it was not coerced or improperly influenced by Musk. Some also expect fresh lawsuits to be filed, potentially dragging out the dispute for months more. However, shareholders will hope the vote keeps Musk focused on Tesla. In January, he had threatened to build AI and robotics products at his other companies if he didn't get his way. On Thursday, shareholders also approved a plan to move Tesla's legal home from Delaware to Texas. And they re-elected two board members, Musk's brother Kimball, and James Murdoch, son of media mogul Rupert Murdoch. 
Cambodian authorities burned more than four tons of seized illegal drugs at a ceremony in the capital. The drugs were incinerated ahead of the International Day Against Drugs Use and Illicit Trafficking this month. The drugs destroyed today were seized over the last three years and included cocaine and dry marijuana. Most of them were trafficked from the Golden Triangle area between northeastern Myanmar, northwestern Thailand and northern Laos. An AI candidate is running for parliament in the United Kingdom. AI Steve is an avatar of real-life businessman Stephen Endicott. Steve is running for parliament as an independent. A politician wanting to reinvent politics. Hi, I'm AI Steve, standing to be MP for Brighton and Hove. But what happens when the candidate is the actual invention? Meet Steve, that is AI Steve. An avatar on the ballot, a UK first. You're actively dangerous. Dangerous? You think the public can't be trusted? It may feel like something out of that dystopian Black Mirror episode where a comedian uses a computer-generated avatar to cause electoral chaos. But now it's happening in real life, sort of, with AI Steve running as an independent. AI Steve, was Brexit a good idea? Brexit is a complex issue with varied opinions. He can dodge a question like a real politician, but AI Steve will do exactly what his constituents tell it to do in Parliament, according to its creator, Steve Endicott. Policies for the people, by the people. The human version of Steve says he's an eco-friendly capitalist with a conscience who is fed up with traditional politics. But he promises he'll follow AI Steve's guidance if elected. According to a UN report presented to a Security Council briefing, children living in conflict situations have experienced violence at unbearable levels in 2023. The UN Secretary General Special Representative for Children and Armed Conflict called on the international community to recommit to protecting children from the effects of armed conflict. The evolving nature, complexity and intensification of armed conflict as well as the use of explosive weapons in populated areas has led to a shocking increase in grave violations against children in 2023. The report revealed that 32,990 grave violations were verified against 22,557 children in the year. The annual report listed the parties to serious violations, with the Israeli armed forces and security forces for the first time included in the list for killing and maiming, attacks on schools and hospitals, and related personnel and denial of humanitarian access to children. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Przewalski horses, named after the Russian geographer who discovered them, used to roam across Central Asia. However, by the late 1960s, they had vanished from the wild, surviving only in captivity. Today, an ambitious international effort is reintroducing them to their natural habitats. These are the world's last wild horses. Shavalsky's horses, named after the Russian geographer who discovered them, once roamed across Central Asia. But they disappeared entirely from the wild by the end of the 1960s, remaining only in captivity. Now, thanks to an ambitious international effort, they're being reintroduced to their original habitats. This is the Golden Steppe region of Central Kazakhstan a vast area of grassland and wetlands covering some 2,700 square miles. Shavalsky's horses haven't lived here for nearly 200 years. In early June, the Czech Republic's Prague Zoo returned seven horses to the area. The stallion and six mares were transported first by Czech military planes, and then several hours by truck, accompanied by zookeepers. Scientist Albert Salem Garayev says reintroducing the horses will help the country's conservation efforts because they eat a wide variety of grasses and spread the seeds. For scientists, yeah, it's also quite important to have these uh, wild horses in the, in the central Kazakhstan to distribute non-native uh, non or not common uh, plants in the steppe and also prevent the fire. 
Efforts to reintroduce Chowalski's horses in China and Western Mongolia have already been successful, where the population has reached 850. In Kazakhstan, the horses will stay in an acclimatization enclosure for a year to learn how to find water and food during the steppe's harsh winters. The zoo plans to move approximately 40 more horses in the next five years. And that's all the stories we have to report to you tonight on World News. Tune in again on Monday for more key updates from across the globe. Stay tuned as we'll join you in just a moment with the Nightly Business Report. Thank you for watching. Good night.